Thank you for joining us at Journey Church. Our hope is that these messages challenge your soul, equip your spirit, and inspire your future. For more information about our church, please visit us at ourjourney.church. Now, here is Pastor Vince Farrell. Well, I kept saying good morning to everyone about 20 times because I have missed you guys. It seems like I've, it's been forever since I got to see you. So, good morning. It is so good to be back home. Dale and I were traveling a couple weeks ago to Florida to speak at a church that is really focused on sending missionaries around the world. Uh, This year they have somewhere around 80 students. They've been doing this for about 14 years and have sent over 1,000 young people to the mission field. That is amazing, amazing. A couple weeks ago, uh, the Sunday before Mother's Day, I spoke to us concerning how to hear God's voice. And I want to just kind of pick up with part two, if you will, this morning on what I'm simply calling discovering God's will for your life. I've been in ministry for many years, and the number one question I get time and time again, whether it be from young people or us old people and older... And that is, God, uh, Pastor Vince, how can I know God's will for my life? I feel like there's there's just something that God's calling me to, but I don't know what it is. How can I know God's will? Let's just take a show of hands. Those of you watching online, you can give a thumbs up. And that is, by a show of hands this morning, how many of you have ever wondered the question, how can I know God's will for my life? Yeah, look around. Every single one of us in here have wrestled with this. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand on the next question, but the next question is, how many of us are still looking to know what God's will is? And maybe that's you here this morning. And so, for a few moments, I want to talk to us from a biblical perspective on how to know God's will. And before we dive in, we've got some questions we need to answer. And so, here is the first question. Is the God we serve a personal, relational God, or is he a distant ruler only approachable through a representative? And I'm not here to tread on Catholicism, because maybe you're here this morning and you would say, well, you know what, Pastor Vince, my mom and dad and grandma goes to church for me, and I go to church, but when it comes to Christianity, when it comes to a personal relationship with God, I think I'm good because, because my family, they're good. We, we typically, in this room, would understand that, that, you know what, it's not about having one man represent an entire nation of what God says, but instead, I think we would all agree that this morning, God is a personal God, that He desires a personal relationship with you. Here's the next question. Does God get involved in our everyday details of our everyday life, such as choosing a mate? Does God care who you marry? Does He care who you date? Does He care... What house you have, what car you buy, what job you have. Does God really get involved in all that? I I hope you would agree with this statement. Yes. Yes. See, we have a personal God who is personally involved in the personal details of our personal life. We need to understand that because too many times we can get caught up in playing religious duty on Sunday morning and Monday through Saturday we forget about all this. Because the God of this morning is the God of tonight. He's the God of tomorrow morning. He's the God of next week. Where are you going to be in your relationship with him? I want us to look at a scripture verse that we're going to kind of stem our thought process this morning from. 
It comes from Psalms 143, verse 10. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of righteousness. Teach me. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. This process of learning how to know God's will. Because he is my God. Say that with me. He is my God. He is a personal God that has a personal plan for your personal life. If you're here this morning and you've got breath, God has a plan for you. I believe that with my whole heart. God does not make mistakes. There's no such things as accidents. Because my God is that big that he has a personal plan for every single person in this room and outside these walls. For you are my God. Your spirit is, say it with me. Your spirit is good. The Holy Spirit is good. Lead me into the land of of righteousness. If you're taking notes this morning, I'm simply tiling this message. Show me your will. Show me your will, God. Now, let me say this. Some decisions are easy in life. Amen? I mean, some decisions are super easy. It's just a a, a matter of, is it good or bad? But many times, there's decisions in life that both of them are good. And we're asking God, okay, God, both of these options are, are pretty good here. I mean, this is a great house, and this is a great house. This is a great guy, and this is a great guy. This is a great gal, and this is a great gal. This is, I mean, this, these are both high-paying jobs. But which one, God, am I supposed to invest my life into? Which one am I supposed to date, supposed to marry? Which job am I supposed to take and move to? And they seem like good choices. Now, when it comes to understanding God's will, I want to kind of break it down to you on how I've been taught when looking at God's word. And that is, God's will can be sectioned into three different departments. Much like a a three-legged stool. That God has a providential will. Or or for those of us in here that that you grew up in church, you've, you've heard about the sovereignty of God. Providential is the sovereignty of God of what's going to happen is going to happen because that's how God wants it to happen. There's the moral will, which many in the church world just say, Pastor Vince, skip over that. Let's not talk about morals, okay? I mean, I want to live my life the way I want to live my life. Amen or oh me, one of the two, I'll take. And then there's the personal will of God. And this is where we want answers. We want to know what is God's personal will for me. This is much like a a three-legged stool in the sense of each type of will God has, if you take one of them away, you come crashing down. It needs all three legs to stand on. If I could say it this way, if you want to know God's personal will for your life, then you must follow And abide his moral will and providential will. Let me give you what providential will is. Providential will simply is God's will that that is a secret plan which he governs everything that happens in the universe. There are things that are going to happen that God orchestrated because it was his will. It was his will that Jesus Christ go to the cross and die for our sins. Amen? Which leads us way back into the Bible. When you look at Moses leading the nation of Israel, Moses was trying to govern over two million people. And his father-in-law, Jethro, comes up to him one day and says, you know, Moses, the thing that you're doing is not good. I mean, you're trying to 
hear everyone's cases and, and, and decide if it's right or wrong. What you ought to do, and Jethro gives him a bit of counsel about setting up some leaders within the tribe of Israel to help govern. And it sounds like a great idea. It sounds like an awesome idea until you follow the lineage of those leaders and you find out that thousands of years later, hundreds of years later, that those leaders were the scribes and Pharisees that said, crucify Christ. See, everything happens under providential will because God is God. He is an awesome God. Amen. Amen. He is unstoppable. We sang it this morning. Amen. Amen. I mean, what, what makes him unstoppable? Because the fact he's God and you and I are not. This is his providential will. That what is going to happen is going to happen because he has destined it to happen because it is his will and you can guarantee he is a good God. That's why he can make the promise that all things work together for good. The second type of will, the leg, if you will, is the moral will. Oh boy, this is a big one in Christian church in America. Because we don't want to hear about moral will. But God's moral will consists of the revealed commands in the Bible that teach us how we ought to believe and live. And when I practiced that this week, I just, in my mind, I saw a standing ovation and people cheering. And Thank you. We don't get excited about this because I'm an American. Who's going to tell me how to live? I'm free. I can do my own thing. Have you given your life to Jesus? Well, yeah, I'm a Christian. No, no, no. Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Well, I prayed a prayer when I was four. <laughs> Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Well, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, the devil even believes in Jesus. I'm asking you, have you surrendered, given up, laid down your life, and taken up Jesus' mantle? Because we have a moral code to follow. And we need to get away from this grace covers everything. Grace compels us to follow God's rules. Whoa, 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 Pastor Vince. You just said the word rules and church. That's pretty legalistic. No, it's called obedience. Thank you. I'm here all day, y'all. God's moral will. <clears throat> to know God's personal will for your life, you must follow and understand His providential and moral will. I discovered that those that struggle with the parts of God, God's will for their life, they struggle what to know what it is, it's because they're also struggling to know and understand and follow His moral will and His providential will. Let's look at Psalms 143, verse 10 again. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of righteousness. I'm going to give us this morning, if you're taking notes, three primary indicators. Three Lights, if you will. <clears throat> the, way I, the reason why I say lights is because uh, in aviation school as well as in uh, boating, at nighttime they teach the pilots that when it's time to land, when you're looking for the runway, there's three specific lights that need to line up. You need to get in alignment that when those three lights line up, you're headed in the right direction for the runway. Same way with boats when it comes to bridges, that you line up those lights... And when those three lights line up, you know you're safe from crashing. I want to give you this morning, if you will, three lights, three indicators of how to know God's will for your life. We're going to call these three keys 
to spiritual discernment. And I'm specifically using the word spiritual discernment because we as believers need to grow our faith in God that we can detect and know not only just good from evil, but the difference between God's plan and will for us and something that just sounds like a good idea. We need the Holy Spirit to give us discernment to understand we are walking in God's will. So how do we do that? Number one, we need to ask the question, does it line up with the written word of God? What I'm looking to do, does it line up with God's written word? Psalms 119, 104 and 105. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. I love that. 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Your word. Jesus went on to say in Matthew 4, 4, that man shall not live by bread alone, but every, what? Every, every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Psalms 119, verse 133. Direct my steps by your word and let no iniquity have dominion over me. Time and time again, God's word gives us this roadmap, the first light, the first discernment of is this good or is it God? Doesn't line up with God's word. I've been in ministry for a long time. I've had many counseling sessions with people. And I, I could tell you some stories. I use those stories to help guide my children off the path of unrighteousness. So please, continue sending me emails and messages because I'm teaching my children how not to live. I let them know, man, sin will mess you up. And I have people say, well, you know, I just feel like God is, 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 is wanting me to move in with my partner and, 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 and move in together. Oh, really? You feel like that's God's will? Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee sexual immorality. Thank you. I got one amen from our elder. I just feel like it's God's will for me, for me to marry that unbeliever. Oh, because 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, do not be unequally yoked. Got a little bit more on that one, okay. I just feel like it's God's will for me to withhold this income earnings because after all, I mean, I could give more to the church. Really, because God's word says, thou shalt not steal. I just feel like it's God's will for me to take personal revenge for what they did to me. I mean, if you knew what they did, then, then you would know that it's totally okay for me to do this. Really, because Romans chapter 12, verse 19 says, Do not take vengeance. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. You know, I just, I'm just not into corporate church. I think I could just have a personal relationship with God and me and God would be okay. I think it's God's will for me not to do church in a big corporate building, really, because Hebrews 10.25 says, do not forsake coming together as some are in the habit of doing. I would have thought everyone here would have gave me a good amen on that one. <clears throat> Those of you watching online, I expect to see a thumbs up on that one. Amen? I, 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 I love hearing this argument because you see the neglect of people understanding God's Word. Well, you know, Pastor Vince, the, the early church, they met in homes. They did because they didn't have big buildings. The only big buildings they had was coliseums where they were killing Christians. Well, I just don't know if the, the early church was, was real big and corporate, really, because check out Paul's writing to Timothy. Timothy, the pastor of the early church, met in a cave with over 100,000 people. 
Well, I'm just not into mega churches. Well, you're not into God's word then. I have gone where angels fear to tread. I just, I just feel like it's God's will for me to, to have an affair with that person because this one ain't working out. I mean, I've heard it all, y'all. How to get me a t-shirt that says that. <laughs> but we know God's word says, thou shalt not commit adultery. So whatever you're feeling in your spirit, <clears throat> line it up with God's word. Because God never leads anyone contrary to the word of God. Amen. Never. Right. Never. He never leads anyone contrary to the word of God. And I've had to, I've had to look at some people who, who I know they love God and I know they're doing their best, but I've had to look at them and say, listen, what you're hearing is not God's will. Right. It's just not. Because it goes contrary to the written word. And if it's going contrary to the written word, then you're listening to something else besides God. Amen. Number two. Is there Holy Spirit confirmation? Hmm. So, Pastor Vince, you're telling me I need to surrender my life to Jesus and allow the Holy Spirit to live in me? Absolutely. Is there Holy Spirit confirmation? confirmation? Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21, is a, is a great verse because it gives us this understanding of who is talking. Your ear shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Who? Who is whispering, this is the direction you should go? It is the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And not only does the Spirit of God bear witness that we are his children, he bears witness that we're on the right path that we're doing His will, that we need to hold off on that direction. Are you here this morning? As children of God, He speaks to us, and He allows the Holy Spirit to give us this, some of you old-timers remember this, the unction. Do I have any unction people here? The unction of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 15 talks about this. One of my favorite stories. I mentioned this two weeks ago in the message. If you missed it, here it is. The early church had a big debate. You thought you were in a church that had, you know, arguments. The early church got in an argument. And they want to know, should we allow Gentiles that are not circumcised to be able to call themselves Christians? And Peter stands up and he's given his testimony. You know, I had this dream these birds and animals. And I was like, no, Lord, I'm not going to touch anything unholy. And, and God said, don't say anything I've created is unholy. And it dawned on me. He's talking about all creation. And Barnabas is talking and Paul is talking. I mean, and they get in, they get in such an argument that it says there in scripture that Paul and Barnabas got into a heated discussion. That's King James where they were throwing down. And James stands up and he quotes scripture. He says, you know, this is good. God foretold that this was going to happen, that, that, that Gentiles, people who are not God's chosen people, like us Jews, that they would hear the good news of Jesus, and they too could accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So let's not make it hard. And Scripture says this, it seemed good to us and the Holy Spirit. Do you have and are you sensitive to the Holy Spirit seamer. That when you're walking in life and you're praying about what to do, that the Holy Spirit is whispering in your ear, that you hear the confirmation. Pastor Vince, you know, I'll be honest, sometimes I'm just asking God to speak to me through a song. Well, then I would challenge you to develop a prayer life. Well, I'm just looking for the, the big wow. It says in 1 Kings chapter 19, 11 and 12, that the prophet was running from some trouble. 
And he was in a cave and he was asking God to speak. And it says that the Lord passed by, that the mountain began to break, but God was not in the earthquake. That a fire came down, but God was not in the fire. That winds, tornado, and God was not in the wind. But then the next verse says, after the earthquake, after the fire, that the Lord was not in those, a still, small voice. God was able to talk through a still, small voice. And I know what the pushback is, but Pastor Vince, I'm busy. I mean, I've got things. I, I'm a busy person. Can, can I just ask you this question? Are you more busy than Moses leading two million people out of Egypt? Are, are, are you more busy than King David overseeing a nation? Are, are you more busy than Daniel running the Persian Empire? Are you more busy than Joseph as the prime minister over Egypt? Every single one of us would have to answer no. Can, can we just get real for a moment? Us being busy is just a cop-out in not doing the hard work needed to develop hearing the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm saying to this to you as, a, as a, your pastor who loves you enough to tell you the truth. There's not one person in here that has more time or less time than the next person. We all have the exact same amount of time. You have 24 hours, I have 24 hours. But what we invest our time doing shows if we've developed the sensitivity to hear God's voice. Hudson Taylor, missionary to China, I love how he says this. He says, Satan will find something for us to do instead of seeking God, even if it's just arranging the window blinds. He will always try to find something to get us distracted from doing and spending the time we need to develop the ear to hear God's whispering voice. Number three, <clears throat> do circumstances point to God's hand? Do circumstances point to God's hand? Revelation 3, 8, our associate pastor, Will Groskopf, read this morning. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. God will use circumstances to get our attention. And if those circumstances reveal that God's hand is at work, then that's a good indicator to move forward. I shared with you earlier about people saying, I feel like it's God's will and this and that. One of the things I will always ask someone when they, ask, when they say the question, I believe it's God's will for me to have that job, is I will ask them, does it make you work on Sundays? Now, I get having to work a few Sundays here and there. We all have that. I get that. But I'm talking about habitual missing Sundays. Oh, Pastor Vince, you just asked that because you're a pastor and you want people to come to church. No, I asked that because it lines up with God's word about being faithful to meet together as the body of Christ. That's why I ask. I had an individual say, well, yeah, they're going to they're gonna have to work nights and, and weekends. And I said, I don't think it's God's will for you to take that job. And the husband goes, well, she's going to take the job. I mean, we need the money. I don't think it's God's will. Are, are you chasing after money or are you chasing after biblical principles? Well, we'll be fine. We'll be fine. And I watched from the sidelines of this church as a family who were consistently in God's house. She took a job that took her out of God's house and he would become hit and miss ever so often. Faithful week after week turned into twice a month for him. Once a month for him. So now they're not even in this place. 
Do you see God's hand in it? Because if God's principles and God's hand is not in it, I can pretty much guarantee you that is not God's will for your life. One of the questions I get time and time again is, Pastor Vince, what brought you and your family from Arkansas to Kentucky? And it's a glorious story. I'll give you the cliff note version. The pastor of this church had been pastoring for about 11 years and was ready to retire. He had a gentleman in his life that he considered a spiritual father. Now, I want to pause at that exact wording because I want to tell you what's happening in my life at this time. Laura and I had just moved away from Alabama as youth pastors and started traveling the globe. Missions work, marriage conferences, youth camps, and was traveling full-time for three years. During that three years, I connected with a dear friend of mine, Pastor Donald Sims, in London, Kentucky. I'd speak for him and build relationship with him, and through that I met a gentleman by the name of Rick Clendenin. Rick Clendenin has many spiritual sons in this area as well as around the world. To me, Rick was another man of God. To him, I don't know what I was. Probably annoying. (laughs) But we developed a relationship. And occasionally I would call Rick about needing some advice about a certain subject or situation. Fast forward to the end of that three years, the pastor wants to retire. And he knows a gentleman by the name of Rick Clendenin, a spiritual father. And he asks him, do you know of anyone? You know of a lot of spiritual sons. Rick Clendenin called his spiritual father by the name of Dale Yurton, my father-in-law. Dell and I at the time were seeking God and counsel for what to do. I had a passion to church plant. I went to the church in Arkansas that I served for five years as a youth pastor, Pastor Ronnie Gilmore. Thank you for investing your life into me. And I'm sorry a whole lot. And I went to Pastor Ronnie Gilmore and I said, Pastor, I, I feel like, you know, maybe church planting. And it would be in your back door. What do you feel about that? And he goes, absolutely. I'll help you. I'll even send you some people. I said, no, no, no. I know who you'll send. Don't, please. No. I went to my home church, who was in the midst of transition as well. Pastor of 40 years, getting ready to pass the baton. They said, right now is not a good time because we're about to hand the baton and we don't want to drop it. We don't want to make sure people understand Dale Yurton and Vince Farrell aren't leaving the church over the new guy. I said, that makes total sense. I submit to that. Now, some of you might be thinking, now, wait a minute, Pastor Vince. If God put it on your heart, why don't you just do it anyway? Because God's hand is not in rebellion to authority. So I submitted to my pastor. We prayed about what to do. There's a church just a few miles from us that was looking for a campus pastor. It was a denominational church, and it was a few-month process of us going on to become a campus pastor there. We met with them, we met with the pastor, interviewed the whole nine yards going through the process. In, in my gut, I, I'll be honest with you, I struggled with the thought of, can I, can, I, can I submit to a denomination that I don't fully agree with? I don't know. Because at the same time, the pay was amazing. At the same time, the insurance was awesome. At the same time, I could step into a church that was already formed and a couple hundred people Can I say it this way? It looked really good. We're getting close to the end of the journey with this church. The pastor says it's really between you, who is a risk, and another guy who he's grown up in the denomination. And we like you both. 
And I get a phone call from the pastor of this church saying, I heard from Rick Clendenin that you are looking at pastoring. And so we started the process in faith, met with Jerry and the elders, prayed about it, and I asked God. I threw out the fleece and said, God, you're going to have to answer this because if I look at the two, I know where I want to go, my flesh wants to go. God said, is my hand in the other? Well, God, I mean, there's a lot of great things there. Is my hand in it? Why do I have you meet people? Where are the relationships at? I could have never have put together in God's provisional will that part of the process of meeting Rick Clendenin years before was going to lead me to a church that the pastor called and asked, do you know of anyone? I see God's hand in that. There were a couple other confirmational things that happened that I'm sharing with you today. And so I can say beyond a shadow of a doubt that it is God's will for me to be at Journey Church. And the reason why you need to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God has called you to marry that person, to go to that job, to be planted in this house, the reason why you know need to know beyond a shadow of a doubt is because storms are going to come. Hard times are going to happen. And it's in those moments you go, I don't even know if I should have married this person. I don't even know if I'm supposed to go to this church. When the honeymoon's over and the dust has settled, did you still hear God's voice? I got a little news flash for you. If you're looking to go into ministry, ministry is murder. It is hard and difficult. You invest your life into people and they leave because you said something they didn't agree with. The Holy Spirit helps us to discern. Helps us to hear. Now, those are the three, but if you're here this morning... You've got a couple questions. And I hear your questions because I thought of these questions too when I was praying about it. Pastor Vince, what about advice from other believers? I mean, I grew up, and, 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 and Scripture even says, there's wisdom in the counsel of many. That's true. And let me, let me give you the reason why this didn't make the top three list. Because number one... You need to make sure their counsel is rooted in God's word. Have they prayed about it? And are they a spiritual Paul in your life? See, too many times we don't look for advice, we look for permission. Woo, that's a good preaching statement right there. I'm just going to back up and hit it again. Are y'all ready? Too many times we look for, ad- for permission and not advice. Okay? We, we, we start asking our friends, hey, what do you think? Because I'm really kind of thinking I should do this. And they go, oh, yeah, that sounds great. You ought to do it. And guess what? You shouldn't be doing it. And so, so what I say, are they a spiritual Paul? See, <clears throat> spiritually speaking... The relationships in your life will fall in one of three categories. One, they're spiritual Paul. They're someone spiritually more mature than you. Dale Yurden is a spiritual Paul in my life that I can go to and go, hey, I'm thinking about this. What do you think about that? What does scripture say? And every single time, every time, every single time, guess what, guys? Every time. You're not going to believe this. Every single time. I don't know if you heard this or not. Every time he points to scripture. Every time points to scripture. Every time. Every single time. Every time. Every single time time points to scripture. Not sometime. Every time. 
You need a spiritual Paul in your life. Too many times we go for spiritual Barnabas. Barnabas is someone who's right there with you. Man, they're, they're journeying with you. They're on the same path of you. They're the same spiritual maturity. These are the people that you love to do life with because they're right there with you. And you need a spiritual Barnabas. That's great. They encourage you. But you can't ask for God's will from a spiritual Barnabas. Because their gut reaction is just to encourage you and to tell you what you want to hear. And the third person is a spiritual Timothy. This is someone that you should be a Paul to. So, so what, about, what about the advice of other believers? Only if their counsel is rooted in God's word. They prayed about it. What, what do you mean they prayed about it? Man, you know, I got this issue, and I was thinking about this and this, and I feel like God's leading me to this. What do you think? Well, you know what? That sounds good. And you know God's word? And, and yeah, that sounds great. It took no time to pray? No, no. Pray about it. Because you need to see if the Holy Spirit is confirming something. Number three, are they a spiritual Paul? Well, well Pastor Vance, I, I don't know if I have a spiritual Paul in my life. I can point you to a few. Because every single one of us in this room needs a spiritual Timothy that we're pouring into, a spiritual Barnabas that can be there to encourage us, and a spiritual Paul that can advise us, correct us, counsel us. Amen. Okay, Pastor Vince, what about peace? What about if I feel at peace at something, I should move ahead? Peace is a great tool. The problem is, you and I have to know the difference between if it's our peace or God's peace. Let me, let me just confess something to all of you. I am, I am at total peace at buying a Harley Davidson. I just, I just, I have no qualms about it. I'm at total peace with it. But there's another spiritual element that God gave me to speak into my life. Her name's Laura Farrell. And she's not at peace. Do, do you see what I'm saying? I have discovered in life that it's easy to muster up peace for something you really want. Woo, I just went to preaching on that one. It is easy to muster up personal peace for something you really want. Oh God, I know he's not a believer, but he's just so fine. I'm just, I'm just at total peace dating him. <clears throat> peace of God is totally different. There have been times that I have not had the peace of mind to do something because God called me to something that was dangerous, risky. So what do you do? Well, God, I, I thought you want me to live a bubble wrap life. Never, never take any risks. God never said that. When you're living in God's will, Brace yourself. It's going to be a whirlwind. But do you have the peace of God? Do you know God's voice? This is why you've got to develop, and it takes time to develop the ear to listen to God's voice. I don't do this so much because my kids have grown. But when they were younger and we would go to Walmart and, and they'd run to the toy section and Laura and I go look at different area and I was ready to get the kids attention in the midst of Walmart. <whistles> that simple whistle and their heads would poke out. <whistles> and they come running. Like I said, I don't do that so much because it annoys them. They're at that age of... <laughs> Dad. But my children know my voice. My children know my voice. Jesus said, My sheep know my voice. So it's going to take time. 
Because, here's the last thing, God is more concerned about who you are becoming than what you're doing. God, is it your will that I do this or do that or date him or her? Well, I don't know. Who are you becoming first? Are you becoming a person who's sensitive to hear God's voice? Are you becoming a person who's disciplined to learn God's word? If you follow these lights, if you line them up, I promise you, time and time again, you will be a person who's walking in the fullness of knowing what God's will is for your life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Thank you for joining us at Journey Church. Our hope is that these messages challenge your soul, equip your spirit, and inspire your future. For more information about our church, please visit us at ourjourney.church.